Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is April 23rd. Today we celebrate the birthday of the greatest playwright who ever lived, and he incorporated over 200 plants into his large body of work. We'll also learn about Wordsworth's favorite flower, Lesser Celandine, and we'll hear some words about the flowers that we often fall in love with, simple flowers. And we grow that garden library today with a book about kitchen gardening that came out last year, and then we'll wrap things up with the English bluebell, or Hyacinthoides nonscripta, and it is this flower that honors St. George, the patron saint of England. But first, here's today's curated news. Today's curated news is from House and Garden. This is an article that was written by Isabel Bannerman, and Isabel is the author of a book called Scent Magic, Notes from a Gardener. Now, in this particular article, Isabel gives us a scented tour of her garden in Somerset. And here's a little taste of what Isabel wrote in this piece. She writes, Any gardening we do needs to be sleepy and understated, but practical. The washing always flapping above the vegetables on sunny days. We shall plant all the sweet charmers, sweet Williams, sweet Sicily, sweet Rocket, sweet Alyssum. Sweet Nancy's will grow among the throngs of primroses and violets already here. There will be precious corners of muscari, hyacinths, and lily of the valley. Well, if you can imagine, these are just a handful of the flowers that Isabel is growing in her garden. And she offers so many ideas for flowers that will offer beautiful fragrance in your garden. So, if you have a passion for a scented garden, be sure to check out this post by Isabel Bannerman over at the Facebook group for the show. Once you're there, all you need to do is head on up to the little magnifying glass and type in the word scent, and Isabel's post will pop right up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group for the show, don't worry about it. You can always join. You have a standing invitation. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the words Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Now, before we get to today's botanical history, there are a couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention. First, if you listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, please be aware that they're making some exciting changes to the podcast app. Now, this major update to the platform is going to make it easier than ever to discover and enjoy podcasts, which is very thrilling. And these changes are set to begin in May. But in the meantime, I've had to go in and set up a new account through Apple for the show. And what I'm hearing from other podcasters that are going through this exact same process is that occasionally this results in a disruption in the feed for the show, which means that you could jump on the podcast app between now and April and not be able to hear new episodes of The Daily Gardener. Now, if that were to happen, I do want to make sure that you know that you have an alternative way to listen to the podcast if there were to be any disruption in service, and that is to head on over to the website for the show, thedailygardener.org, and right there on the front page, you're able to play the podcast. Now, again, I'm thinking that any disturbance will be temporary. So don't panic, but at the same time, just keep this information in the back of your mind if there's any disruption in your ability to get the podcast. 
Now, the other thing that I wanted to share with you is also very exciting. If you've been listening to the show this week, you know that I'm trying to get 50 reviews for the podcast over on Podchaser, and I'm so appreciative if you take the time to do this. But let me just plant this little seed, this little incentive for you to do this in April, because Podchaser is giving 25 cents to Meals on Wheels for every review that is left for a podcast over on their website. And then if the podcast creator replies to the review, they will donate another 25 cents. And then as luck would have it, my audio host, the place where I store all of my audio files, has also agreed to throw in another 25 cent match for any review of the shows that they host. So if you leave a review for the Daily Gardener podcast between now and the end of the month, you'll not only be helping out the Daily Gardener podcast, but you'll also be helping out Meals on Wheels with a 75 cent donation. So if you've been meaning to leave a review and it just kind of keeps slipping your mind, try to remember to do so in April because that way you can really maximize your effort and you can do something really good for a very excellent organization, Meals on Wheels. And apparently this is the second year in a row that they have done this. And this is yet one more reason why I personally am such a huge fan of Podchaser. They have great customer service. They do a great job of supporting podcasts and podcast listeners. And I also just have to say that if you're on Twitter, you should definitely follow Podchaser because they have a very witty person in charge of their Twitter feed. And I always appreciate the fun interactions that I have with them over on Twitter. All right. Now, again, today is Friday. It's the end of the week. And that means that later on tonight, I'll be sending out the Friday newsletter for the show. This is like a little garden note from me to you. I put in a little extra botanical history and poetry to tide you over the weekend. And you'll get to see all of the book recommendations that I've made on the show this past week. They're all there in a nice little list. Plus, you'll see what's going on in my own home and garden. So if you want to sign up for today's edition of the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter, make sure to head on over to the website for the show, thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org, and then right there on the home page, you'll see a spot where you can sign up for the newsletter. And that reminds me, don't forget to check in your spam filter or in your promotions folder for the newsletter. The first couple times you receive it, you may have to hunt it down because your email provider, whether that's Hotmail or Gmail, etc., may accidentally tuck the newsletter in your promotions or your spam folder. So if you want to make sure that it gets to your inbox, you'll have to make sure to drag it into your inbox. And then once you do that, you shouldn't have to do it again because that will train your email to accept mail from the Daily Gardener. Okay, it's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for today, April 23rd. Today is the birthday of the English author, poet, and playwright William Shakespeare, who was born on this day, April 23rd, in 1564. A lover of gardens and the science of botany, William Shakespeare included hundreds of references to flora and fauna in his plays and sonnets. And each flower that he mentioned would have conveyed a symbolic meaning to his audiences. In addition, William was a master of metaphor. And as gardeners know all too well, Flowers are a source of endless metaphors. 
Now, since William's death, there have been many books written on the elements of nature mentioned in his works. In 1896, the great gardener and garden writer Henry Ellicombe did a marvelous job of reviewing all of Shakespeare's plant selections, and he also took note of the plants that were not mentioned. He wrote, Shakespeare has no notice of common flowers like the snowdrop, the forget-me-not, the foxglove, or the lily of the valley. And in 1906, the garden author and illustrator Walter Crane, one of my favorites, created beautiful anthropomorphized plants in his book, Flowers from Shakespeare's Garden. This book, just like Henry's book, has also been digitized, and I've put a link to this one in today's show notes as well. And finally, in 2017, a book called Botanical Shakespeare was published by the Shakespeare historian Garrett Queeley. The subtitle for Garrett's book is An Illustrated Compendium of All the Flowers, Fruits, Herbs, Trees, Seeds, and Grasses, cited by the world's greatest playwright. You can get a copy of Garrett's book on Amazon right now and support the show using the link in the show notes for around $6. And Garrett's book is gorgeous. The watercolor illustrations are absolutely incredible, and I love all the quotes and insights that he provides. And incidentally, the great Helen Mirren, one of my favorite actresses, wrote the foreword to Garrett's book. Today, Shakespeare fans and gardeners delight in a specialty garden known as a Shakespeare garden. And there are roughly 50 of these specialty gardens around the world, and they only cultivate plants mentioned in William Shakespeare's work. There's a lovely little Shakespeare garden in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, and from what I hear, it's semi-hidden. So if you've been to the park and you had no idea there was a Shakespeare garden there, you're going to have to make sure to do your homework so that you can find it. There's another Shakespeare garden with over 50 flowers on the Evanston campus of Northwestern University. Central Park in New York City has a little Shakespeare garden, and it's located between 79th and 80th Streets. And in 1914, the Dunedin Botanic Garden in New Zealand established a Shakespeare garden that includes a replica of Shakespeare's Boxwood Knot Garden in Stratford-on-Avon. And how could I not end this segment on Shakespeare without sharing a few favorite flower quotes? This one's from Richard III. Sweet flowers are slow, and weeds make haste. This one's from Hamlet. There's rosemary, that's for remembrance. Pray love, remember. And there's pansies. That's for thoughts. And here's one from A Midsummer Night's Dream. I know a bank where the wild thyme grows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses, and with eglantine. And finally, here's a short verse from Twelfth Night. Away before me to sweet beds of flowers. And today's the anniversary of the death of one of the founders of English Romanticism, the poet William Wordsworth, who died on this day, April 23rd in 1770. A lover of nature, William often wrote about our relationship with the natural world. 
And although William is best known for his poem about daffodils that starts, I wandered lonely as a cloud, William's favorite flower was actually the spring-blooming lesser celandine, or Ficaria verna. William loved this flower so much that he wrote three poems about it. He wrote, There is a flower, the lesser celandine, that shrinks like many more from cold and rain. And the first moment that the sun may shine, bright as the sun himself, tis out again. Isn't that sweet? Well, lesser celandine is a yellow buttercup or ranunculus. It's a woodland star-shaped flower that loves wet areas. And when it is happy, it spreads everywhere. In fact, many places now label lesser celandine as an invasive plant. Lesser celandine also has the unfortunate common name pilewort since it was used to treat hemorrhoids. Nonetheless, William loved lesser celandine so much that he asked that his tombstone be carved with the flower. But in a twist of fate, Thomas Woolner, the British sculptor and poet, carved a poppy flower known as greater celandine instead. This flower looks nothing like Wordsworth's favorite flower, lesser celandine. And here's how the Oxford University Press described Thomas Woolner's Marble Wordsworth Memorial. In two narrow squares on each side of Wordsworth's head, are the daffodil, the celandine, the snowdrop, and the violet. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words are from the American writer and amateur naturalist Susan Fenimore Cooper. Here are her thoughts on spring flowers. How pleasant it is to meet the same flowers year after year. If the blossoms were liable to change, if they were to become capricious and irregular, they might excite more surprise, more curiosity, but we should love them less. They might be just as bright and gay and fragrant under other forms, but they would not be the violets and squirrel cups and ground laurels we loved last year. Whatever your roving fancies may say, there is a virtue in constancy which has a reward above all that fickle change can bestow giving strength and purity to every affection of life, and even throwing additional grace about the flowers which bloom in our native fields. We admire the strange and brilliant plant of the greenhouse, but we love most the simple flowers we have loved of old, which have bloomed many a spring through rain and sunshine on our native soil. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Kitchen Garden Revival by Nicole Johnsey Burke. This book came out in 2020, and the subtitle is A Modern Guide to Creating a Stylish, Small-Scale, Low-Maintenance Edible Garden. In this beautifully styled book, Nicole shares everything you need to know to set up and establish a functional and beautiful kitchen garden. And Nicole sees the potential for kitchen gardens in any and all outdoor spaces, no matter how big or how small. 
a fan of raised beds, smart crop selection, gorgeous design, attentive care, and harvesting your favorite garden fresh edibles. Nicole's Season by Season Guide helps you create the kitchen or food garden of your dreams. This book is 208 pages of growing your own delicious organic food in a beautiful, low-maintenance, raised garden right outside your door. You can get a copy of Kitchen Garden Revival by Nicole Johnsey Burke and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $11. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today, April 23rd, is St. George's Day, the feast day of the patron saint of England, St. George. Known as the Dragon Slayer, St. George was partial to the color blue, and he's remembered with the English bluebell, or Hyacinthoides nonscripta, a flower that blooms around this time each year. And the flower and fairy author, illustrator, and poet Cicely Mary Barker created a bluebell fairy poem along with a beautiful watercolor image of a fairy holding a bluebell. The first verse goes like this. My hundred thousand bells of blue, the splendor of the spring, they carpet all the woods anew with royalty of sapphire hue. The primrose is the queen, tis true, but surely I am king. In the book, The Brief Life of Flowers, Fiona Stafford writes, Bluebells are reminders of the very origins of spring, the great gush of life. English bluebells are simpler and less floriferous than the invasive Spanish variety. Anne Bronte recognized the simplicity of the bluebell in her poem about the blossom. She wrote, But when I looked upon the bank, my wandering glances fell upon a little trembling flower, a single sweet bluebell. Well, recently, I came across a modern bluebell poem from Stella Williams, and it addresses the damage that humans can do to natural areas like the woodlands where bluebells like to grow. And in 2018, the Woodland Trust featured verses of Stella's poem along their woodland paths to remind people that traipsing through nature areas can cause long-term damage. Here's The Bluebell Blues by Stella Williams, who is also a content manager at the Woodlands Trust. Help us beat the bluebell blues, a problem caused by paws and shoes. Keep to the path, enjoy the view, and let the new green leaves push through. As leaves unfurl and buds hang free, they hint at beauty we'll soon see. But if dogs or walkers go off track, we may never get that beauty back. Now the flowery bells unfold and violet carpets are unrolled to delight you and all who follow. Let's ensure they're here tomorrow. When the bluebells fade and die, beneath the soil their bulbs still lie. If damaged, they could disappear. Protect them and they'll grow next year. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.
The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you on Monday.